What's up everybody, Matt Moran here for another weekly update. So there's lots of news to go over here this week. And the first big story this week is the new Toyota GR86 that finally was revealed. So this was the thing that was being teased. We thought it might be something else. Turns out, no, it was just a Subaru reintroducing the BRZ alongside uh, Toyota's new GR86. So, uh, it turns out that, you know, the new name that was rumored turned out to be true, but the recent rumor about the 86 being delayed apparently is not true because they say that, uh, Toyota is saying that this vehicle is going to be on sale in Japan this fall. So, uh, seems to be right on schedule here alongside the BRZ. And details on the American version, unfortunately, will be coming later, but in the meantime, you can see they stuck to the same formula as before with identical sides and back end to the Subaru BRZ but with a changed front end. So it gets a unique bumper and wheel finishes along with different headlights with an L-shaped DRL instead of the C-shaped uh, daytime running lights you get on the BRZ. And so let me know in the comments below which version you prefer. Personally, I prefer the BRZ. Um, I don't know, it just looks a little more stylish to me. Uh, maybe it's because I like the previous generation BRZ uh, and stuff, I don't know. But uh, I just think it looks a little, little bit better. But a lot of people really like the GR86 styling. I think it still looks good. I don't think it looks bad by any means but I just think I prefer the BRZ again uh, but mechanically it's identical under the hood so the global release does show four more horsepower um, than the new BRZ's initial number um, that Subaru of America put out but the new numbers uh, in this joint release apply to both the 86 and the BRZ and that was proven with the um, little infographic they had there which said here's the specs and it's for both cars um, so not one is not going to have more power than the other lots of outlets this week were wrong Wrongly reporting that saying, oh, the Toyota gets four more horsepower. That is not the case. So there's either one of two things going on here. Either they found four more horsepower uh, in the past few months since they revealed the uh, BRZ, or it could be that the global version does make four more horsepower because they get much better, higher octane gas in Europe and Japan than we get here in the States. And so if they're rating the uh, you know horsepower on you know crappy 91 octane gas here in the States or something, that could account for that slightly lower number as well. So whether it's 228 or 232, um, it doesn't really matter. It's you're not going to feel four horsepower difference, but it will. They will both be the same. You know, it'll either be one or the other. But anyway, so whatever the final number ends up being, um, you know, like I said, it still is pretty good with 184 pound feet of torque. Nice jump up there uh, as well. Um, and they say that uh, the zero to 60 time has also dropped by over a full second compared with the old 86. So now it does a 6.3 seconds zero to 60. It'll be available with the six speed manual, which I believe is just a carryover or the six speed auto, which is a carryover. Um, and so the auto versions will also be getting Subaru's eyesight driver assistance tech that is only on the automatic versions. The manual um, doesn't get any of that stuff uh, which is kind of refreshing because eyesight tech is not great in my opinion um they also said that they tuned uh, toyota tuned the suspension differently to uh, give the gr86 a different feeling than the uh, brz which is what they also said in the past one um and in the past generation it really just ended up being like different springs and here it appears according to what i've been reading on the um forums and stuff it sounds like the differences could just be either stiffer rear springs or softer front springs or you know some combination of the two or something i'm not sure but most likely it's probably limited to spring tuning and that's about it um so the weight is just as low as the previous version which is fantastic it only weighs 2800 pounds they say there's aluminum fenders now aluminum uh roof and uh, you know they try to keep the weight in check and so that's great even though it runs you know that again uh, 2.4 liter nationally aspirated boxer engine um, so you know a little bit bigger engine but uh, you know it's great that they've kept the weight in check and uh, inside it's the same as the uh, BRZ other than the seat trim and the infotainment system and you will see there's two different infotainment systems there for the 86 the one you're seeing is the Japanese spec version which gets a different head unit then you will see the left hand drive version which does have a more normal Toyota head unit you'll see here in the states and so it's basically the same is the past generation previously though the past generation also got different gauge fonts doesn't seem like they changed the gauge fonts this time around um so maybe even a tiny bit less differentiation than before but honestly i'm just happy that both of these are continuing i think they're going to be fantastic with this amount of power i love the brz i just my previous generation brz i loved i just wished it had a little bit more power um and i think this could really be the sweet spot and be exactly what these cars needed and uh, so yeah it's just great to see it i'm excited to test it out and see you know 
uh, how those uh, improvements feel. And uh, the GR86 also will be available in Europe, which is something they you can't say for the new BRZ. Unfortunately, the new BRZ is only for Japan and North America. Um, so if you're in Europe and you want one of these, you're going to be stuck with the GR86 anyway. Um, but it's not a bad thing to be stuck with. It still is obviously basically the same as the BRZ and also fantastic. During this joint reveal, Subaru also revealed the JDM version of the BRZ, which is the same aside from the clear side marker lights. Um, they also revealed some STI accessories, though. That you'll be able to get um, like a front lip, a fender garnish there, different wheels, a carbon fiber spoiler that looks pretty cool, as well as a STI exhaust and a few other little things. And so cool to see those little improvements there. Uh, also, uh, there is another new Nissan Z picture that leaked out uh, this past week uh, on the Club 400Z forum again. And so this one shows a bright blue interior um, that appears to be an option, likely pays homage to the blue interior that was offered on the 240Z back in the day. And so it's great to see that they're going to be offering fun colors. You know, there's Obviously, they're going to probably bring back the Nissan Orange. Um, they'll have a lot of other bright colors. And for a sports car, I feel like that's what people want. I mean, yes, there's always going to be the people that want the boring white and silver and black and stuff. But it's just great to offer color, especially on the inside. That's, you know, you know, pretty rare. So it's great that they're doing that. And uh, I just hope we get the full reveal of the Z soon. Um, hopefully they won't have to wait too much longer for that. Um, Hyundai this week had a slight disappointment in their press release about the Kona N's dual clutch transmission. They put out a release about how awesome the dual clutch is and stuff. Um, and so in it, though, it says Hyundai has specified all units of the Kona N with NDCT. So this means there is no manual that's going to be available for the Kona N, even though it's using the same powertrain as the Veloster N, which means theoretically it should be able to pair up to the Veloster N's manual and offer it here in the Kona, but that sounds like that's not going to be the case. Now, I mean... The DCT is fantastic. It seems like it really made a huge improvement in the Veloster N. I have not driven the Veloster N with the DCT yet. I will be driving one in May and we'll be posting a review next month on that. So stay tuned for my thoughts on it. But um, you know, it sounds like it's really gonna be impressive and um, this could also mean the Kona N potentially could get all wheel drive because that DCT can be paired up with all wheel drive unlike the manual I don't believe can be. So. You know, I'm still not sure. We still don't know if it's going to be front-wheel drive or all-wheel drive or both. Uh, but, you know, we're just waiting on all that. And I don't know when the full reveal of this thing is going to finally happen. They've been slowly teasing this thing out for months and months now. So um, I, don't know, I don't know when we're going to see the full reveal, but hopefully it'll be soon. Another bit of unfortunate news uh, this week was that Chevy confirmed to Autoblog that they're getting rid of the 1LE option for the V6 and four-cylinder turbo versions of the Camaro. Um, and they didn't say why they're getting rid of it, but most likely there just probably wasn't a huge take rate for them, especially for the four-cylinder version. I think it wouldn't be super strong. But if you want a better handling 1LE uh, you know, version of the Camaro, you're going to have to go for an SS or a ZL1. And, or you can get one of the many, I'm sure there's other 1LE still sitting on lots and stuff you can still snatch up if you really want. Um, and so a little bit of a bummer there getting rid of that. You know, we'll see if Ford follows suit and gets rid of the high performance package for the EcoBoost or if they stick around with that because I don't know how hot that's been selling either. I've only seen, I think, one or two since those came out on the streets. Um, but anyway, interesting to hear that. GMC this week has revealed the SUV version of the Hummer EV. And so uh, this is a 2024 model year vehicle that will be arriving in early 2023. So still two years off for this thing. Uh, but compared to the truck version, the SUV has an 8.9 inch shorter wheelbase and a body that's 20 inches shorter than the truck. Um, and so this means it's gonna be better off road, of course, and more maneuverable, especially with the four wheel steering that's gonna be available and the crab walk mode that already debuted on the truck. Um, also helping off roading is the extract mode that can raise the SUV to 16 inches of ground clearance temporarily. And other things uh, that are unique here for the SUV are the swing out tailgate that has a spare tire mounted on it. There's uh, unique wheels and the enclosed cargo area, of course, as well, which is does seem to be a decent size, but not super huge. It does have some storage under the floor and stuff as well. Uh, but unfortunately, because of this shorter length, another unique thing about the SUV is that it'll be slower and have a shorter range than the truck version due to having less batteries on board. So while the truck boasts, you know, a thousand horsepower, three seconds zero to 60, 350 miles of range, all those things they were, you know, bragging about a few months ago. The SUV maxes out at 
830 horsepower, the three and a half seconds zero to 60 time, and 300 miles of range. And GM didn't get too detailed about the battery size, but they only say the Ultium battery pack has 20 modules instead of the 24 on the truck. So, you know, I mean, we're still talking about 830 horsepower, so it's nothing to complain about. Still talking about a three and a half seconds zero to 60 SUV. Very, very impressive stuff. But for this reason, I'm assuming that uh, the truck will be the hotter of the two vehicles. You know, and everyone's gonna wanna have that top dog and have the, that thousand horsepower to brag about and stuff. Um, otherwise, everything else on the truck or on the SUV is the same as it is on the truck, including the big screens, the removable roof panels, the 17 available camera angles. They even have you know the underbody cameras, all that kind of stuff, and all the other features that uh, we talked about uh, many months ago here with the truck version. All that same stuff applies here for the SUV version. Um, there's also a trail mapping feature, which estimates how much charge you have left and uh, and how much charge you'll have left after a trail. It can actually estimate your usage on the trail, which is you know kind of something that hasn't been done before. And it also ensures you'll have enough power left to make it to a charger. Um, so that's kind of a nice uh, little touch there. It can also be optioned with a generator that can put out 240 volts or three kilowatts of power to help charge other EVs or you know, power a campsite, you know, those types of things. Although it's still, that's a far cry from the amount of power that you can get with like with an F-150 with their generators and stuff, but still nice nonetheless. Uh, the Edition 1 um, with those maxed out specs will be arriving first, starting at $105,595. Um, and there's actually an off-road package you can put on top of that to make it $110. Uh, so very pricey. That's exactly the same price as the truck, by the way, as well. So um, that's another reason why I think the truck's going to be hotter because because for the same money, you get an extra, you know, 170 horsepower with the truck, an extra 50 miles of range, and a half second faster zero to 60 for the same money. Unless you know you really don't want a truck and you need the smaller size, which is still going to be a massive beast. You know, I just feel like the truck is going to be the one everyone goes for. Um, but anyway, and so those max specs can also be had on on an EV3 X trim, which is 100 grand. So you can knock a few grand off that way if you want. There's also going to be a slower 625 horsepower version of the SUV that's going to be coming in two trims. Those will be starting at 80,000 and 90,000. And um, that cheapest $80,000 version that won't be arriving until the spring of 2024. So we're talking three years away before that thing shows up. Um, so it's similar to the uh, truck version where, you know, unless you're willing to spend hundred grand on one of these things, you're not going to be able to, you know, get one of these cheaper ones until, you know, three years from now. So it's going to be a long wait if you want to get an affordable one there. Although affordable is a relative term, we're still talking about 80 grand for that base model, which is still pretty, pretty pricey. And anyway, these can be available to reserve now. So you can go get one. I think they already said, you know, they've had tons of reservations already. Um, so there's probably a long wait list already for these things. But um, yeah, cool to see that. GM also confirmed this week uh, that an all electric Silverado is coming with 400 miles of range. And that will be built in their Detroit factory, which is now called Factory Zero. And GM President Mark Russ said Chevrolet will take everything. Chevy's loyal truck buyers love about Silverado and more and put it into an electric pickup that will delight retail and commercial customers alike. Um, and they didn't say exactly when it will arrive or give any more details on it. Um, but the 400 miles is a nice upgrade over even what the Hummer truck does. So, uh, you know, I'm guessing there's some type of extra improvement there to eke out the extra 50 miles, but very interesting. And, you know, we'll see if this beats the uh, electric F-150 to the punch or not. I'm assuming this might be a little bit behind, but we'll have to wait and see. The CEO of Polestar this week uh, has been teasing what looks like a sportier version of the Polestar 2 on his Instagram page. And uh, based on the hashtags and the pictures, it appears to be lower uh, with an Olin suspension, Brembo brakes, and bigger wheels, along with sportier bodywork. It could also get more power as well, of course, but that's hard to tell from pictures. Uh, but we'll have to wait for an official reveal before we know for sure about any of this kind of stuff. And there is the number 7 and 1 that goes along with uh, these pictures, I'm, I don't know if that here, they're teasing a July 1st reveal for these or something. Um, so we'll have to wait and see on all that. But I don't think even regular Polestar 2s are in dealers yet, or if they are, it's very early on. So um, you know, I don't think there's too many people that have you know been wanting to upgrade just yet. They haven't even experienced it yet. But uh, great to see that Polestar is working on a better version here. 
Polestar also interestingly announced Project Zero, um, which is their goal to make a carbon neutral car by 2030. So instead of just offsetting production emissions by planting trees, um, which their CEO says is just a cop out, um, when these other companies are like, we're going carbon neutral and all they do is plant a bunch of trees and then still do everything else the normal way. Um, their goal here is to decrease emissions during the entire manufacturing process and um, and some surprising transparency. Uh, they revealed that the Polestar 2 EV requires 64% more emissions to build than a gas XC40, for example, which we already knew, you know, the mining of the battery materials and all that kind of stuff does emit more, but then you make it up on the back end because you're not burning gas for the next 10 years. And so that's how, you know, EVs in the long run are more, uh, you know, environmentally friendly from a carbon standpoint. Even though that is the case, if they can reduce manufacturing emissions, um, they can drastically widen the emissions difference between gas and electric and uh, you know make these much much more uh, carbon you know neutral and stuff so that's pretty awesome we also encourage other car companies to do the same saying car manufacturers have not been clear in the past with consumers on the environmental impact of their products that's not good enough we need to be honest even if it makes for uncomfortable reading and that is a bold statement and I very much you know respect them for putting that out there and being like Yes, you know, it's not quite as green as, you know, it might be advertised as, but it still is better, um, you know, from a carbon standpoint, but it's not, you know, like you're actually truly zero emissions or anything like that. And so I really like that they're super transparent. And like you said, you know, put the info out there, be transparent, let people make of it what they want, what they will. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it's pretty awesome. And I, I think you can't go wrong with transparency and honesty. So great to see that. Uh, information continues to trickle out here on another electric vehicle, the Mercedes EQS. Um, so, you know, last week it was the interior that was shown. This week it's the powertrain and the battery. So Mercedes gave ride-alongs to some publications and revealed some detailed specs along with those ride-alongs. And so last week, you know, they said it was going to have 478 miles of range on the very easy uh, WLTP European testing cycle, which in the EPA here, you know, maybe it'll be a little over 400 miles, but that's about it. And so now they explain that that's possible thanks to a huge 107.8 kilowatt hour battery pack, and that's usable. 107.8 so i mean the actual battery packs probably 110 or higher um and so yeah pretty crazy yeah, it's a huge battery there was also going to be a smaller battery version as well but they didn't reveal the size of that smaller version um, but both versions will be charging at speeds up to 200 kilowatts um, for about 186 miles of range in just 15 minutes but again that's the wltp numbers you know, maybe think of something in the low 100s, you know, on our own testing, but still to, you know, get over 100 miles of range in just 15 minutes is still pretty good. They also revealed some horsepower figures. Um, the base rear wheel drive version with one motor will do 329 horsepower. The dual motor all wheel drive version will do 516 horsepower. Um, and that does mean that the rear motor is stronger. So it will be a rear bias kind of system, you know, it will be good for performance. The 060 for the slow version is going to be six and a half or 6.3 seconds. So still pretty quick and then the faster version there is going to only do a 4.3 seconds zero to 60 um, for the dual motor so still very strong performance and this isn't even the amg versions they did hint that an amg version will be coming later uh that's a foregone conclusion you know they put amg stuff on everything and so especially on this there will be an AMG version and it will most likely be well into the threes for the zero to 60. Um, and thankfully we don't have long to wait for the full reveal of this vehicle. It's announced it's going to be revealed fully on April 15th next week. Um, so we'll see finally what the thing looks like in production form. And uh, yeah, it'll be the final piece of this EQS puzzle. Mercedes has also revealed a light refresh here for the 2022 CLS. So the biggest change here is that all models now get the AMG line styling, which is kind of interesting, but kind of makes sense considering if you're buying a CLS over an E-Class or S-Class, you probably are looking for something a little bit sportier anyway. Um, there's also new wheels and a new grill similar to the new C-Class with those mini Mercedes logos and the studs there for the grill. It also gets the new Mercedes steering wheel with its uh, capacitive touch buttons on it. Uh, mechanically, it's all the same. Um, so no changes as far as the engines and stuff go uh, but it's interesting they revealed this already because they don't plan to start selling them until early 2022 so we're probably almost a year away from these things actually hitting dealers and it's such a minor thing they could have totally revealed this in the fall and no one would have 
been upset and you know waiting on the edge of their seat for this but um anyway nice to see it nonetheless another 2022 refresh uh, that was revealed was for the jeep compass so this is the european version but our american version should be basically identical aside from orange side markers and the headlights most likely those headlights by the way though are new led lights and they're combined with a slightly different grill to freshen up the front end there the back end appears to be unchanged uh, but the biggest change is on the inside where it looks much more expensive than before and i was pretty wild when i first saw these pictures i was like man that's nice so it's got a 10.1 inch screen in the middle there available it does still come standard with an 8.4 inch screen but supposedly both screens still use uconnect 5 the new uh, software there so there's also a 10.3 inch digital gauge uh, screen available as well there's a new steering wheel dashboard improved materials throughout they say even the center stack Looks like it's been restyled there and uh, has some more storage, they say. Lots of really nice improvements there. I mean, for a vehicle that, you know, this isn't a full redo. This is just a little refresh, but the interior is like entirely new. And so very nice improvement there. Looks like a mini version of the Wagoneer, honestly. In Europe, it also is going to be getting that 4XE plug-in hybrid uh, variant, which will most likely come here as well. We're still just, again, waiting on those North American details to know for sure. But I think it seems pretty likely since they revealed it on the Wrangler that we'll be getting it for everything else it's available with in Europe. You know, I think that'll all come here pretty soon as well. Um, speaking of the Jeep Compass, though, the Alfa Romeo Tonale, uh, which is the subcompact crossover rumored to be sharing a platform with that Compass, has been reportedly delayed, according to Automotive News. So it was supposed to arrive this year, but now supposedly it's not coming until sometime next year. Um, and they claim it's because the Stellantis CEO wasn't happy with the performance of the plug-in hybrid version which most likely is that 4XE plug-in hybrid, um, which in its top uh, form can do 240 horsepower, which does sound like alpha numbers. I mean, you get 280 with the Stelvio, and so for this smaller Tenale to do only 40 less horsepower, Seems pretty decent. I don't know if maybe this the powertrain wasn't smooth enough or if there's some refinement issues that aren't befitting for, you know, an entry-level luxury brand like Alpha or something. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, but supposedly that's that's the rumor is that he wasn't happy and so they're going to go back and refine it. Um, but whatever the reason is, I'm sure Alfa Romeo dealers are not happy about this. They haven't had a new product in several years. Um, and so they desperately needed this and especially it being the, the most affordable Alpha ever, most likely. You know, I'm sure they're going to be bummed that they're going to have to wait till next year to sell these. Um, but hopefully it ends up coming here and uh, it doesn't have to have too much of a longer wait. But interesting to hear that. And the last news story this week is another uh, bit of news from Italy here. So there's a new low volume Italian supercar company called Frangivento, I think. Um, they revealed their new Sorpasso supercar. So it runs a naturally aspirated V10 that does 610 horsepower. And while they didn't say where the engine comes from, um, especially since it's paired up with an all wheel drive system, those specs are identical to Lamborghini Huracan engine. So that would be my bet, is that they uh, ran over to Lambo, bought some uh, some Huracan engines, and tossed those in here. It's you know common that these kind of companies do you know buy engines from other companies. Spiker is also you know they bought engines from Audi and stuff. The, this is a common thing, um, and it's a fantastic engine to buy if that's what you're going to use for your supercar. Using the Lambo V10 is great, um, and so yeah, and that's also combined with it has a carbon fiber tub, so this is lighter than a Huracan. It only weighs 2,866 pounds, um, so that should be pretty fun I and mean, we're talking basically the same weight as that new 86 and brz but with uh, 610 horsepower from a v10 sounds like fun uh, also if you want even more power there's a gtx x version that adds a supercharger to bump the power to 850 horsepower and again, I'm assuming probably only adds, you know, an extra 100 pounds or so tops. Um, that one does a 2.9 seconds 0 to 62 time, and it does 0 to 124 miles per hour in 9.3 seconds. Top speed is 214, and they didn't provide any interior pictures, but they claim that it's luxurious and very customizable. But one odd thing is uh, that the car has what they are calling an avatar driving assistant that you can supposedly have a normal conversation with, and it will simulate uh, the feeling of having a pass passenger as far as you know the conversation and stuff which sounds really weird and kind of sad if it's like well you don't have a passenger so you can talk to the computer and it will pretend to be a passenger for you uh maybe that maybe it's cooler in practice than it sounds in the uh, press release but uh 
yeah, that's an interesting little thing. And I mean, for a tiny little company like this, they don't have cutting edge like technology. If this were Audi or something, I'd be a little more optimistic, but I feel like that will be kind of glitchy. But who knows? Maybe it'll be uh, something good. I don't know. Anyway, the car is going to be starting to arrive in July, and there's no pricing or production limitations revealed for these things, but it's very low volume. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of these kind of boutique, uh, you know, supercar companies. So they don't really sell in high numbers because it's. I think the demand isn't super huge, honestly, but you know we'll see how many they end up making. Of course, however uh, many they make, they're not going to be cheap regardless. So you're talking about V10 engines and carbon fiber tubs and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, very interesting to see that. But yeah, that's it for all the news this week, guys. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this weekly update. Thank you guys very much for watching. Please continue to stay safe and healthy. Let me, do, let me know your thoughts on everything in the comments below, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Take care.